it gives me great pleasure now to introduce a social innovator. He is part of the Young Foundation of UK and Director of Action for Happiness, which is a movement focused on creating a happier society. So all the way from the UK, would you please welcome Mark Williamson. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I seem to have brought some of the British weather with me. I do apologise about that. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Action for Happiness. It's an organisation that I have the, the privilege to run and uh, a little bit about this idea of a, of a global movement for happiness that we're, we're trying to create and uh, in the way in which I would love you to, to, to get involved in, in what we're doing. Um, I can't take any credit for the original thinking behind this idea. It comes from a range of wonderful, inspiring, influential people, including someone you may have heard of, uh, Professor Richard Layard, who was one of the very first economists globally to really start taking happiness seriously. Um, he wrote a book about a decade ago on happiness, which had a profound influence on, on my life. Uh, but when I first met Richard and heard about this idea for a, a movement, I, um, I was inspired. I thought, this sounds fantastic. I'd love to, to get involved. Um, but I also thought, are there any other sort of charities, non-profit organizations already working in this area, there must be, surely. So I went online to what is the oracle of the, the non-profit world in the UK, the Charities Commission website, and I, um, I did a search for similar organisations. And, uh, and this is what came up on, on my screen. Your search for happiness has produced no results. <laughs> Rather unfortunate. Um, but I'm going to start today with, with a question. Um, and it's a big question, which I hope will join us on screen. Uh, and it very much follows on from what Martin, uh, Martin Seligman was saying this morning. How do we measure and how should we measure our progress as a society? Now, of course, there are lots of answers to that. But for the last you know, 50, 60 years, the main answer to that question has been in terms of wealth creation, growing our economy as the measure of, of success. Now, of course, economic growth brings lots of benefits and progress in science and, and medicine, and of course in developing countries, growth can lift people out of poverty and really difficult life situations. But has it actually been making us any happier, all this growth in our economy? What's it done to a, how we feel about our lives? So if you don't mind, I'm going to share with you a graph, and this is quite classically what we see in the developed world, looking here at increases in income per capita, or GDP per head, over time for about the last 60 years. And it's gone up, um, you know, even, even in spite of the current economic turmoil. You know, on average, in developed countries, we've seen you know, a, a twofold, threefold increase in wealth over that period. So has that made us any happier? Well, the tragic answer is, as this second line shows, that on pretty much any measure of happiness, in this case, it's looking at life satisfaction. And this information is from the US, but the, the trends are similar in other, in other countries. You know, at best, we've flatlined over that same period in terms of our sense of happiness and well-being. Um, we have literally got richer, but no happier. And you know, that, that raises a really big question, which is basically, what on earth are we all doing? Um, we put so much emphasis into this growing of our economies, both politically and, and sort of society-wise, but also as individuals into growing our wealth. And yet, that hasn't been translating into improvements in our, in our lived experience. So, you know, that's a graph, and a graph tells a story, but I think this, more importantly, links back to how we feel about our lives and you know, our, our experience of the modern consumer economy, which is basically that it's failing to deliver fulfilling lives. And I love this quote from Tim Jackson, which says, we're being persuaded to spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to create impressions that won't last for people that we, we don't really care about. And um, tragic, but I mean, how, how true is that about modern life? So that's really where this idea of action for happiness comes in. It's sort of an antidote to this, this problem, the fact that we are too obsessed with wealth creation and, and not obsessed enough with how do we improve people's well-being, people's happiness. And so really the idea is a movement of people from all walks of life, from policymakers to healthcare workers to teachers to business leaders to just all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. And the unifying idea is that it's people that care about happiness and, and think that our overarching priority as a society should be to improve people's overall happiness and, and well-being focusing less on just growing the economy and more on improving our lives. So 
We only launched just last year in April. We are blown away by the kind of response we've had to this idea. Over 20,000 people have joined up as members of the movement from 120 or more different countries. We're so honored to have His Holiness the Dalai Lama agree to be our, our first member. And as you can see, we've got representation growing around the world, although a lot of what we do is still focused around the UK, where, where I'm based. Um, but you can see this is starting to, to spread around the world. We, we still have um, a little bit of work to do with our, our friends in Russia, who um, don't look quite as happy as the rest of us. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but, but, but this idea is, is starting to, to take hold. And really, um, you know, what, what the movement is all about is a personal commitment to the way in which you approach your lives. So of course we need to be calling for systems to change, for politicians to do more. But actually happiness and creating a happier society starts with each of us. And so our members, when they sign up, have a chance to make a pledge. And it's a very simple pledge, but it's quite profound. And the words are, I will try to create more happiness and less unhappiness in the world around me. Um, you know, and that, that, that plays out in your role as a parent, the way in which we, we treat our children. Uh, as a colleague, the way in which you, you, know, you are um, in, in your working environment. As a, as a neighbor, the way in which you treat your neighbors on the street. We can each make a difference not only to our own happiness, but to those people that we connect with in our lives. So this goes from the, the big picture, where we've seen you know, people trying to, for example, change policy on mental health that affects the whole local community, through to day-to-day -day stories. And a lovely one I had recently was a, a lady, she, she'd been, she wrote to us and she'd been cycling to work, um, rainy day, her bike got a puncture, she didn't have her repair kit with her, she was sort of by the side of the road, almost in despair as to how she was going to get to where she needed to be on time. Um, another cyclist came flying past, a guy, one of these guys, you know, dressed in lycra, looking like they were in a hurry. Um, and he stopped and he saw her and he said, and came over and to help and he got out his repair kit and mended her puncture. And she um, was very touched and she said, that was so kind of you, uh, what, what made you stop? And he said, well, I've just joined this movement called Action for Happiness and I wanted to do something to make other people happier today. So that's just you know, one example of the sort of ways in which this idea can inspire people to, to, to think differently about their, the, the way they connect with others. Um, so what do we really want to see happen is, is this. Coming back to that graph, it doesn't really matter what happens to the economy. Of course, the economy affects lots of aspects of our lives, but it's just a means to an end. The end should be that the quality of our lives improves. So our vision is that over the coming years and decades, we see measured levels of happiness and well-being increasing in a way they just haven't done in the last 50 or 60 years. Now, that's quite a lofty ambition, and how on earth do you think about doing that? And this is, unfortunately, a gross oversimplification of the, of the situation, but I would say that the two main things we need to do are encourage our governments to do more to create the conditions in which people can lead flourishing lives, but also that each of us as people, as individuals, and the communities that we're in, we can be doing so much more to use this wealth of knowledge we now have, much of which we've heard at this amazing conference, about how it is possible to lead happier and more fulfilling lives, and help get that out to people, help them use it in their schools, in their communities, in their workplaces. So I'm just going to talk very quickly about each of those two areas, what we can do policy-wise, and what we can do with individuals and, and communities. So, We've seen some really interesting shifts in the last few years. Again, this was referred to earlier on, but um, the UK Prime Minister, David Cameron, this is a quote from actually a few years ago before he came into power. And I'll just read it out for you. It's time we admitted there's more to life than money, and it's time we focus not just on GDP, but on GWB, general well-being. Well-being can't be measured by money or traded in markets. It's about the quality of our culture, the beauty of our surroundings, and above all, the strength of our relationships. And I think that's actually quite remarkable that a politician is able to talk in those terms in a world that's so obsessed with growth being the comparator of, of success. And many people in the UK are desperately frustrated with what Cameron's government are now doing. It's a time of austerity, it's a time of cuts. Lots of things that affect our well-being are being potentially put at risk. But to his credit, he's kept with this agenda, and now what's going on in, in the UK, and indeed in, in some other countries as well, is a, an official measurement of happiness and well-being. So so, for example, hundreds of thousands of households in the UK are now being asked questions like, this is in national surveys, how satisfied are you with your life? How happy are you? How anxious are you? To what extent do you feel that the things you do in your life are worthwhile? 
So as well as all this normal data we collect, like crime and housing and health, these objective measures of life, we're actually digging into the things perhaps that really matter most. How do people feel about their lives? And we're using that, we hope, in future to make better policy decisions. So, um, as of, I think, so let me just go back, uh, as of yesterday, um, I believe the UK has become the leader in terms of the largest ever data set of well-being information, official information being published. And uh, I thought I'd share with you just a couple of things that came out of that to give you an insight into what this sort of information tells us. So, this, is, this first graph is looking at the links between happiness and different types of relationships. This is data that was just published two days ago. Um, and it shows that, in general, married people are happier than people who are cohabiting, who are happier than people who are single, who are quite a lot happier than people who are divorced. Now, I mean, this isn't perhaps anything new, but having this kind of official data uh, and the ability to look at this by different regions of the country, to look at this by different income levels, and, and to compare this kind of information with other measures opens up a new way to make policy, to think about how it affects our happiness. Perhaps more importantly, unemployment. We've always known unemployment is awful for happiness. It's not only about a loss of income, it's about a loss of identity, a loss of a sense of worth. Um, so we can see that, of course, any kind of unemployment is a reduction in, in happiness. But um, no, th this, this data, for example, shows that the longer you have been unemployed, there's a measurable decrease in, in happiness. We should be doing as much as possible to get people back into work when this happens. Uh, you know, there are implications for people trying to make policy decisions about this. Uh, and it's not just in the UK, I'm pleased to add. This man you may have heard of, but he is Herman van Rompuy. He is the president of the European Union. And what he's holding here is a fascinating book of research on happiness um, from all around the world. And he took it on himself to write to all world leaders at the start of this year. Um, what this is on the right, uh, sorry, yes, which you can't read here, is a letter from him to President Obama. But in it he says, this book comes to you not only with my wishes for a happy new year, but also with my request to you as world leaders to make people's happiness and well-being our political priority for 2012. So here we are seeing a call to you know, all the leaders of the world to say this stuff really matters. And we were delighted that he also referred to Action for Happiness, this growing movement in his letter. So, you know, it's, it's the beginning of change. It's the beginning of government starting to really focus on the stuff that matters. But government can't make us happy. We all know that. This is not about, um, you know, politicians with clipboards checking that we're smiling enough. It's about how, you know, it's a combination of the right decisions in our, in our society combined with how we approach our lives. So what can we do uh, as people and as organizations, not just to create happier selves, but to, to help spread happiness in, in our communities? Um, well, one of the things we can do is make this amazing wealth of knowledge we have about what really makes life happy and fulfilling more available to people. So one of the things we've developed is called the 10 Keys to Happier Living. They're on the screen here. They spell the words great dream. They are great dream for a, for a happier world, if you like. Now, I haven't got time now to go through them all, but I'm delighted that my colleague Vanessa King and I are going to have the chance to run a workshop looking at each of these tomorrow. So delighted to see those of you that will, will be at that tomorrow. The one thing I would say is that top of that list, and they're not in order, but top of that list is giving. And I think this has been so beautiful to see at this conference how often that theme has come up, that perhaps the best thing we can do to make ourselves happier is to realize that when we do things for others, it has such a profound impact not on just on the people we're helping, but on us too. And that's really at the heart of what we're doing. It's about not just a, a self-help movement of people who want to be themselves happier, but people who want to do more to contribute to the happiness of the world around them. And we've got all kinds of resources and materials that, that go with this. This, for example, is a series of posters that go with each of these 10 keys to happier living. So, for example, messages like, if you want to feel good, do good. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. And don't compare your insides with other people's outsides. Um, these are being put up in hospital wards, in classrooms, in workplaces. They're, very, they're freely available, so if you are interested to use them in any way, we'd be delighted if you were to, to share them. But one of the criticisms that I think this movement gets, and I think maybe us in this conference would get, is that perhaps this is seen as some kind of middle-class luxury, some privilege for those that can afford to worry about happiness. Um, you know, we've had, let's be honest, paid a lot of money in some cases to be at an event like this. But these ideas should be accessible to everyone. Um, and so how can we help people who are perhaps in very disadvantaged situations connect more with some of these amazingly important messages? 
Um, so I was just going to tell you briefly about a project called DIY Happiness, Do It Yourself Happiness, that we've been connected with. These two lovely ladies on the screen here, Sarah and Serena Lee, were involved in this project. They also spoke, this is the picture here, from one of our events. Um, and the project was working with disadvantaged communities in London, people where there were high risks of unemployment, domestic violence, crime, and so on. Um, and taking in some positive psychology concepts, some of these 10 keys to happier living, some of the ideas that Marta Seligman was talking about earlier on, and helping these women in very difficult situations find ways of becoming happier and more resilient. And I've spoken to lots of these women, and they, um, most of them said, when I first heard about this, I thought, this has got no relevance for me. How will this affect my life with all the concerns I have? And at the end, in most cases, it was very transformative for them. They came out saying things like, um, it's changed my life. And, and this quote I heard a lot, actually, from talking to people. My circumstances haven't changed, but my ability to deal with them has. And I think what's so important here is this is not about some kind of patronizing, you know, you're, you're, you live in a difficult situation, we're just going to learn to live with it. Um, this is about empowering people to realize that regardless of our situation, this is true for all of us, regardless of our situation, there are things that we can do to, to improve our well-being and to, to create more positivity in the world around us. So the one lady I spoke to said, I'm, I'm more able to get up in the morning to have a positive connection with my partner, to go and find work, to you know, be friendly to the people I live near. And that, that really makes a difference. So um, this is relevant, I hope, in every aspect of our community, not just in those that you would consider to be privileged. So what, what sort of things are we doing with, um, with this movement, with Action for Happiness? Well, one of the areas where we're starting to put a lot of focus, and it's been referred to a little bit here, is, is schools. Education is so important for equipping children with the kind of life skills they need to thrive. But um, we've got a big problem in our education system. It's increasingly becoming a sort of exam factory. It's, it's about churning out children that are servants of the economy. When I, um, when I went to visit a primary school that my, one of my daughters might have been going to, the, the headmistress was a lovely lady. She, she, um, she did a presentation to parents and um, talked about the aspirations of the school. And she said her opening words to these prospective parents were, this is the challenge we're facing. We are, you know, there's such uncertainty in the economy that we're going to have to create children for jobs that don't even exist yet. And I thought to myself, but we're talking about four and five-year-olds starting school. It's not about creating children for jobs. It's, that's not what education is about. Um, and we've, we've got this problem in that we've, we've sort of got the education system a little bit on its head. Um, it should be about equipping all of us with the skills we need to deal with adversity, to have a sense of our values, to understand what it means to make a contribution to society, to be able to be in touch with our feelings and to communicate with others and form positive relationships. I mean, that's, that's part and parcel of growing up anyway. But I mean, we can be doing much more to build that into our curriculum. And, and so what we're doing with Action for Happiness is encouraging schools to, to go back to basics and say, well, why do we come into education in the first place? We did it because we care deeply about the welfare of children. So let's make that at the heart of our ethos. It's about how we treat each other as staff. It's about the, the things we talk about in our lessons. It's about the way we deal with discipline. It's about you know, a fundamental ethos that says well-being is as important as attainment. And in fact, well-being supports attainment. Kids that are happy do better in school. So that's one area. Another area is at work. And the, the tragic situation is that uh, the latest information from the UK says that over half of people in the British workforce are unhappy at work. And that's staggering considering we spend sort of something like half of our waking hours are spent at work. The fact that um, over half of us are, are just not happy there is, is, is a tragedy and such a waste of potential. Such a lot of anxiety and stress in the workplace. Not I mean, of course, because of the current economic situation, but it, it goes more deeply than that. So what we're starting to do is to work with organizations and help, help them see the, the, the benefits that come from uh, you know, happy employees. I mean, we know that people work best when they, when they feel good, when they feel trusted, when they feel that they have autonomy, when they feel that they have positive connections with their, their colleagues. And crucially, when they feel that what they do matters in some way, has a sense of meaning and purpose. It doesn't check take huge changes. It doesn't necessarily take you know, huge pay and perks to get the best out of people. It, it really takes treating them humanely and uh, positively and building a, a kind of sense of mission and purpose into your organizations. So we're starting to work with organizations, big and small, from charities to investment banks, to say happiness shouldn't be some fluffy nice to have. It should be at the heart of what your aims are as an organization, because your people will be healthier, they'll enjoy their job more, and actually you'll be more creative, more productive, you'll be more successful as an organization. 
But finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, what we're trying to do with this movement is inspire people to take action in their local communities. Um, so we are encouraging some of our 20,000 members to become sort of champions and to create local action groups where they live. And so what they're doing now, and we're seeing these springing up around the UK and indeed elsewhere around the world, people are forming sort of happiness-focused local action groups that are doing, putting on film screenings, they are connecting together to volunteer in the local community, putting on street parties, having a book club, discussions, you know, a whole range of things we can do to help get some of this evidence understanding out there and help people connect and, and make positive change happen where they live. So these are just a few images of uh, initiatives we've been involved with um, around the UK. People working locally, connecting across boundaries, getting to know the people they live near and trying to create a, a more positive environment where they live. So you know, if you're interested in this whole idea, we would love you to think about setting up an Action for Happiness group somewhere near where you live. I guess, you know, really, the, the, the fundamental point is here that we need changes in our systems, we need changes in the world around us, but change actually starts from each of us as individuals. So we would love it if you were to want to come and join this movement. Um, it's, it's completely supportive, I think, of everything we're hearing at this conference, this you know, global recognition of that we can do so much more to, to improve um, human flourishing. So actionforhappiness.org is where we're based. There's a huge amount of social media discussion going on around these topics. Um, so we, you know, we'd be delighted if you could join in with that. And I really do believe passionately that change starts with us and together we really can create a, a happier society. So thank you very much for your time.